I didn't publish this, but uh, I'm going to have a children's story. So if the children want to come up. You can sit down there, you can sit up here beside me, however you want to do it. How many of you have seen the ocean? Well, I have a story about a little boy named Conrad. And Conrad lived in the middle of the country. I'm going to say he lived in Missouri. And your parents will explain this to you later. But Conrad had seen pictures in books and on television of these big bodies of water. And he just couldn't understand how there could be a place where the water was so big that you couldn't see from one side to the other side. So he was puzzled about that. But one day, his family said, we're going to take a trip to the ocean. And he was so excited. He's like, is this what I've been seeing in the books? Is there really water that is that big that it actually looks like it goes into the sky? So they got in their car and they drove to this place where they were going to look over the ocean. But he couldn't see any water. All he could see was clouds and fog. And in a long ways away, he could see this little bit of gray sky. And he's like, I think my parents are playing a trick on me. I don't think there's really any water that big. You see, he couldn't see the water, so he didn't believe it was there. But they waited just a little while and the sun came out and the fog that was on the surface of the water burned off. And then he could see the water. Then he believed that there really was an ocean. There really was water that he couldn't see the other side of. Do you believe in things that you can't see? Something to think about, isn't it? Okay, now we'll talk some more about this believing thing while you guys go back to your parents, okay? God is good to us. He gives us a, a mind to use, not just to say, I have a mind. And sometimes we think about things that we would like, we would like to see, we would like to do, we would like to have. And in those situations, Sometimes we don't know whether or not it's appropriate to think those things, to have those things. But as we get started here, let's ask the Lord to be here with us to convict us of those things that he wants for us and for us to do. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the Sabbath again, for this time that we can spend together. We thank you for each person who is here and for each person who is watching online. Father, I am not worthy to stand before this congregation, but your Holy Spirit has called me and has promised to be with us. So I pray that he will speak to each of us now, Father, to 
convict us of your love for us and those things that you have promised to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, while the story for the children was specifically about believing in something without seeing it, it brings us to a point and a time when we have to make decisions. For instance, most of us here have heard all of our lives that Jesus is coming back soon. Have you seen that happen? Of course not. It hasn't happened yet. So if it hasn't happened yet, what's the basis to believe that it will happen? Have you ever thought about that? Why do you believe that Jesus is going to come again? You know, we have the saying that seeing is believing. But it will be too late when Jesus comes back if we wait to see it, to believe it. For you personally, do you have to see things before you believe them? I've heard many times someone makes a promise and someone will say, I'll believe that when I see it. Um, hopefully that's not me when I make a promise. But it could be because sometimes we make promises that that we don't understand what we're saying because other things get in our way of doing things at times. I'll be there at 8 a.m. sharp and I walk out and the tire's flat. Oops. Or there's a wreck and it delays me. James gives us some good advice about that. He says, instead of saying today or tomorrow, I'm going to go to this place, I'm going to do this and that and something else, he says, say, Lord willing. So we can probably guess the sincerity of someone if they make a promise to us and they say, Lord willing, I'll be doing this. Now, there are some things that we probably wouldn't believe unless we see them. But even at that, there are some things we see that aren't really truth. There are many things that you can read on the internet. There's many things that you can see on television, read in books that are purely imaginary. They're not truth. They're not factual. So, quite frankly, while we say seeing is believing, we have to be careful about that. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, Jesus talks about strong delusions. So much so that even if you are walking with God every day, every moment, there's still a possibility that you might believe something that's not true. That you might, you might be deceived, the Bible tells us. Now, I mentioned that I thought that the little boy in the story was probably from Missouri. 
because um, I'm from Missouri, and our state motto is, show me. I am from the show me state. And I think of myself as, as willing to consider things, but there are things that I have to be shown to, to bring it in a realm of opportunity or possibility that that can happen. Now, when we think of doubting or not necessarily believing, there's one person who gets charged the most, more than anybody else that we've ever known, with doubting. And that would be Thomas, the disciple. Now, he, along with the other followers of Jesus lived in the presence of Jesus for some time. And yet we can see that they didn't always understand and therefore didn't always believe everything that was said. For instance, if you turn to Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 21, Jesus and the disciples were going to Jerusalem. And he had been talking to the disciples about what would happen here. And specifically in verse 21, he says that He's going to Jerusalem, and he will suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, this is quite a statement that Jesus is making. This goes against all the plans that everybody else is making for him. So the disciples let's just say, don't believe him. Specifically, one man in particular. In verse 22, this certain man, whose name is Peter, decides that he needs to tell Jesus that's not the way things are going to go. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, the Bible says, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I can't imagine telling Jesus what you're saying is not true. But Peter's vision is short-sighted. He thinks he sees the end of the way things are going to be, so this can't be the way you get there. So Peter's belief in what Jesus says just doesn't seem to be there at all. Now, when we think about Thomas, it's true. Jesus said, why, why didn't you believe? But Thomas wasn't the only one. In John chapter 20, verse 25, we read what Thomas said, and then we'll jump over to Mark to see what the, the rest of the story is. John 20, verse 25. Well, let's start in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, Except I see his hands 
and the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Unless I see it, I won't believe it. So let's go over to Mark 16, verse 14 really quickly. Mark 16, 14. So lest we think Thomas was the only one who didn't believe, Jesus says here, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, as they were eating. And Jesus upbraided them, which is kind of a, another way to say he scolded them, because they didn't believe. He said he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he had risen. So, seeing is believing. We've already discussed that, described that that's true and not true. It comes back in Sabbath school, we were talking about wisdom and understanding things. Um, how do you understand when what you see is true? How do you understand when something is true even though you haven't seen it? It would appear that while we had a doubting Thomas, that maybe we had a doubting Andrew and a doubting Peter and a doubting John and James and Philip and so on and so forth. So as I was thinking about this, I think to myself, hopefully there is not a doubting Bill. Do you believe? It's a pretty broad question, isn't it? Since we were just talking about Jesus, that's probably what you're thinking about when you say yes. But when you say yes, then I ask you, what do you believe? Do you have an answer? What's Peter say? Be ready to give an answer for what you believe. So what do you believe? Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Let's go... Here. And Jesus talks about belief. And what can be accomplished by those who believe. Jesus says in Mark 9 23, if thou canst believe, what does that mean? Well, it means that all things are possible. So what's impossible? Nothing. Nothing. So we can go to extremes here to expand on that but I won't do that today. Nothing naturally includes a reasonable 
bit of that. And a qualification that the Bible describes as well is nothing shall be impossible with God. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? That if you believe, all things are possible. But we have to go back and look at what we believe in. You see, I could believe that I am the most important person that works for my company. You think that's true? I don't even believe that. You see, when, when Jesus says all things are possible to those who believe, we have to we have to look at what that belief is then. We have to see where, what we have to believe in. So, can someone think of a scripture where we might, where we might have some insight into what we should believe in? And I'm throwing a softball to you right now. It's the easy one. Okay, we just read that in Acts, didn't we? Paul and Silas were in the prison in Philippi, and they had been beaten. And in the middle of the night, they decided there's no need to be sad here. There's no need to be downhearted. So they began to sing and praise God. And all of a sudden there was an earthquake. And all the doors to the jail flew open. And all the chains that were on the prisoners fell off. And the, the warden of the prison, the, the keeper of the prison, was kind of concerned because he looks in and he sees all these these doors open and surely all the prisoners have escaped so the bible tells us that he pulls out a sword and would have killed himself but knowing this paul calls out to him and he says don't do anything rash these are my words not paul's don't rush to something you see, the jailer hasn't seen what's going on here. He hasn't seen that none of those prisoners have gone. But Paul says, him, we're all, says to him, we're all still here. And so the jailer comes in, and this is an amazing thing to him. the prisoners are in there for a reason. Most of them are there because they've done something inappropriately. They're there because they shouldn't be out walking amongst other people. And it touches the jailer's heart. So much so that he wants to know what's going on here. And so finally he asks Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And we read it in, in Acts. The answer is they told him, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Not you only, but your household as well.
So this believing has something more to do than just just saying, yeah, that's true. John 3.16. Can someone quote that for me or can everybody quote that for me? What's the key here? Believe. And the reward of believing is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It appears that all I have to do is believe in Jesus and I will be saved. That's what Paul and Silas told the jailer, right? That's what Jesus told Nicodemus, right? But, do we understand what believing really means? You see, in Mark chapter 9, there is a story of Jesus and his disciples. Well, three of his disciples. Going up on a mountain where Jesus met with... Who did he meet with again? Let's see. Moses and Elijah. And he talked to them. And that discussion and that instance is, is a, something for another time. But as they came down, there was this big crowd around the disciples. And Jesus said, what, what are you talking about here? What are you discussing? And a man came forward with his son and said, I brought my son to be healed. He is possessed with a demon. But your disciples can't heal him. And Jesus made some statements. And it depends on which gospel you're looking at that describes what he said. But he he is apparently considering the situation. And the Father says, if you can help me, please. And Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible. And the man's response was, I believe. So do it. Not true. I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So is it possible that we can believe and not believe at the same time? Can you say, been there, done that? I guess this brings us back to the question of what we believe in. Just believe because we believe God exists doesn't mean we believe in God. Let's look at James, the second chapter, verse 19.
James chapter 2, verse 19. James is talking about faith here, but he also brings up belief. And he says in verse 19 of chapter 2, Thou believest that there is one God. Since the first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, that's a good thing to believe in, right? James says it's good to believe in God. He says, but... While it's good to believe in God, the devils also believe. So then strictly, if we say, the Bible said, if you believe, you shall be saved. If you believe, you shall have eternal life. Does that mean the demons have eternal life? So we need to do some more studying then, don't we? The devils believe and tremble. James goes on to describe that believing is not enough. But how can he say that when in Mark and John we read that believing is enough? Let's think back to the father of the faithful. The Bible tells us in Genesis, the 15th chapter, verse 6, that Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Is that all Abraham did was believe? He obeyed as well. So... hmm. He, he obeyed. So this belief has to be qualified then. Let's go to John 3. Since that's where we're told that if we believe, we shall have eternal life. John 3, let's start at verse 10 and read the context of what we're looking at here. John 3, 10. Jesus answered and said to him, now him is Nicodemus, remember? And he says to Nicodemus, are thou a master of Israel and knowest these things not? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. So he's telling Nicodemus, we've spoken to you, we've told you those things that we've seen, you've seen things we've done, and yet you still don't believe. You don't receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, let's stop there and jump forward just a little bit. Jesus is hanging on the cross. And there's a a thief on either side of him. Jesus is being lifted up here just like that serpent was in the wilderness for all men to see. 
Now one of these men sees him and grumbles and complains and says, get me out of here. The other one sees him and says, I deserve to be here. But please, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Do both of them believe that Jesus is going to die on that cross? But not both of them take his death the same way, do they? So, when Jesus is talking here about being lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life, this believing has to be understood for what it is. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not in him is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Remember, even the devils believe, but they're not saved. So when the Bible tells me that if I believe, I can have eternal life, if I believe, I can be saved, we need to understand what we're talking about. Now, chapter 8, I mean, verse 18, brings in another another idea with regard to this believing if we believe not, the Bible says we're condemned. But we're the ones doing the condemnation. So it's our choice whether we're saved or not. It's my choice whether I believe in Jesus Christ or not. Just because my father believed in Jesus doesn't mean that I'm automatically saved because my father believed in Jesus. Just because I believe in Jesus doesn't mean my children are saved because I believe in Jesus. They have to make that choice for themselves, right? So, verse 19, 18 and 19 about the condemnation tells me that if I believe, my actions will show it. As to what I believe, we can see throughout the history of God's chosen people that sometimes they believe and sometimes they don't believe. Their history goes like this. Up and down, up and down. You know, depending on our walk with God, that's the same with us as well, right? I can wake up in the morning and the sun's shining and I can be in the most sour mood. Or... I can wake up in the morning and there's a severe storm going on outside, but I can be, oh well, no big deal. Jesus calmed the storm. Uh, 
Jesus talked about how the people used to worship him with their mouth, but their hearts were far away. Our words mean nothing unless our hearts are true and our deeds follow through. Back to James, the second chapter. James chapter 2, verse 14. Okay. Remember I told you in chapter 2, James is talking about faith. James says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, I'm tempted to, to suggest that we can replace faith here with believe, but we can't go that far. Believing and having faith is not the same thing. James goes on, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say, Depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not food. You give them not those things which is needful to the body. Then what does your blessing profit them? The father in Mark had brought his son to be healed and he had some belief, but he saw in his life some deficiencies and he wanted to get rid of those. He wanted to be rid of all the doubt that was in his heart. Hence his cry, Help thou mine unbelief. Now, let's look at this application in our lives. I say I believe with my mouth. But what do my actions say? Am I ready to meet Jesus? Now perhaps the better question here is, have I met Jesus? Jesus doesn't come to me when I'm ready. Jesus comes to me when I need him. Sometimes my thoughts aren't fixed on Jesus, and that's when I need him the most. Do I follow Paul's call in Romans 10, chapter 9? Well, before we go there, let's back up a little bit. Something that Jesus talked to his disciples about. He talked about judgment day, specifically in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Verses 31 through 46. He says, There comes a day when the shepherd gathers all of his flocks. And then he separates them. He separates them by their deeds. He puts the sheep on the right hand side and the goats on the left hand side. And he tells the sheep, you've done a good job. You've 
accomplished or you've performed or you've done all of these things. He said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I was naked and you clothed me. And the sheep say, I don't remember doing that. When did we do that? And Jesus said, In so much that you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. The other side is exactly the opposite. You didn't do any of those things and said, when did we, when did, when did we see you and not do those things? And he's like, when you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. So now we have a judgment here and it appears that we're judged according to our deeds. Not whether or not I said, I believe. Do we see what's going on here? But if I don't believe, where will my deeds be? This is what James means when he says, show me your faith How? Without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. So, what James is saying to me, don't tell me you believe, show me you believe. In Romans 10, verse 9, Paul tells us If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So we're back to the scripture that says, if you believe, you'll be saved. Have I received the Holy Spirit in my life? In Ephesus, Paul came to some of the disciples and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed. So Paul says there's something else that goes along with the Holy Spirit. I mean with the believing here. He says there's more. If you remember the disciples said we don't know anything about that. We don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. So the Bible tells us that Paul explained it to them and then he gave them the Holy Spirit. Have I crucified the old man of sin, the old man of flesh, to become a new creature, as, as Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. Paul says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Again, this is Romans 6, verses 4 through 6. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we will be also 
in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Just because I say I have done these things or I say I believe doesn't make it so. I need to confess with my mouth, but I need to confess Jesus. Left to myself, I will never measure up to God's standard. Pure and simple. I have sinned. Jesus never sinned. I can't live up to this requirement, to this standard by myself. I can come to him and I can say, have compassion on me. Help me. I found this passage in the Desire of Ages, page 429. She begins saying, If thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. This is a quotation from the father with the child who was possessed, found in Mark. How many a sin-burdened soul has echoed that prayer? And to all the pitying Savior's answer is, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. It is faith that connects us with heaven and brings us strength for coping with the powers of darkness. In Christ. God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait. Amen. And resisting every temptation. Praise God. However strong. But many feel that they lack faith and therefore they remain away from Christ. Let these souls in their helplessness, in their helpless unworthiness, cast themselves upon the mercy of their compassionate Savior. Look not to self, but to Christ. He who healed the sick and cast out demons when he walked among men is the same mighty Redeemer Redeemer today. Faith comes by the word of God. Then grasp his promise. He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That's found, by the way, in John 6.37 for the time when you need that verse. 6.37. There will come a time when you need it. You can believe me. Cast yourself at his feet with the cry, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Now listen to this. You can never perish while you do this. Never. What a promise. If we cast ourselves at Jesus' feet and cry, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief, God will know whether we really believe or not. We if we truly believe, we'll never perish, but have everlasting life. 
Jesus is calling us today to come to him. He wants to help us to overcome sin and darkness that we may live forever with him in light. I do believe he's coming back soon to take his followers home. I pray that each of us will hear his call and be ready, believing that he, our Lord and Savior, loves us so much that he gave his life for us. And because of that belief, we will be able to live with him forever. Our closing song is, is the, the call for mercy from Jesus. The title of the song is Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for gift, the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the promise that if we believe that we shall be saved. Father, it is with deep contrition now, as the song says, that we come before you asking you to heal our unbelief. May we, Father, feel your presence with us always. May we never turn away from the gift of the Holy Spirit. May we obey and do those things which you have called us to do to bring us into your kingdom. Please, Father, we pray that you will make us safe to live with you forever. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.